And we're putting it out through many different organizations in electronic form, in physical form. We expect to distribute the shopping guide totally in the tens of millions next year. So we are going to do what people have been sort of, we've been whining about this for 12 years, waiting for the government to do it for us. What a waste of life. What a waste of life. I'll tell you, by the way, Obama says he's going to label genetically engineered foods. He says that. Let's hear it. Yeah. I'm not going to wait, though. <laughs> How do we avoid GMOs? Four ways. By organic, by products that, are, that say non-GMO, by products listed on a non-GMO shopping guide, or avoid the at-risk ingredients. Now, what are the at-risk ingredients? For the crops, there are four major GM crops. Soy, corn, cotton, and canola. Soy, corn, cotton, and canola. Everyone, soy, corn, cotton, and canola. Now, what are vegetable oils made out of generally? Soy, corn, cotton, and canola. Another excuse to avoid vegetable oils. Okay, minor food crops. Hawaiian papaya, zucchini, crookneck squash, a tiny percentage of the GM crops out there, and also, unfortunately, starting this year, the sugar supply in the United States will be genetically engineered from sugar beets. So this is the first new crop introduced in a long time, so we have to move quickly. We don't have time to waste. Okay, everyone raise your hand. Everyone raise your hand. Thank you all for volunteering to do more <laughs> on the GMO issue, and you will know how to do it within an hour, and it'll be easy and fun and successful. Remember RBGH? Well, your children won't. All right. Yeah. So the reason we're here is due to the, the glories of the Food and Drug Administration. Based on a single sentence, GMOs have flooded the market. The sentence in the policy says the agency is not aware of any information showing that the foods created by these new methods differ from other foods in any meaningful or uniform way. Now, it's obviously not true. In fact, documents made public from a lawsuit proved that that sentence was a lie. But on the basis of that sentence, the FDA said no testing was necessary. The FDA said if the companies that produce the biotech foods believe they are safe, yeah, 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 I guess it's coming, they can put it on the market without even telling the FDA. But a friend of mine sued the FDA. 44,000 internal memos became public. And it turned out that the overwhelming consensus among the FDA's own scientists were that GMOs might create allergies, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. They had urged their superiors to require long-term studies. But every time the policy came back, the new draft of the policy, the concerns of the scientists were systematically extracted and removed and ignored. One scientist wrote in a memo, what's become of this document? It's basically a political document. There's no science in it. It does not address the unpredicted side effects. So who overruled the scientists? The person in charge of policy at the FDA, Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, and later Monsanto's vice president. He had worked with Monsanto and a group of biotech companies before working at the FDA to create the ideal regulatory system for the companies and then evidently implemented it himself. This was in 1992 and his policy still stands. So the companies do participate in a voluntary consultation process, technically called a meaningless exercise, where they bring their conclusions not the raw feeding study data, not real science, their conclusions, and the FDA responds with a letter which says, you believe your foods are safe. It never says the FDA says the foods are safe. It says, 
You understand it's your responsibility to evaluate your foods, and we understand that you've evaluated them as safe. No further questions. And that is our glorious assessment system of genetically engineered foods. Now, one food, one GM food, the flavor saver tomato, was the only genetically engineered crop, the first one, to ever go through a thorough, systematic feeding study that was turned over to the FDA. They did a rat study with the tomato, and the rats refused to eat the tomato. <laughs> Let's hear it for those rats. Yeah. All right. If you ever want to market rat-proof tomatoes, you know where to go. It turns out farmers and scientists and reporters from all over North America say that when given a choice, many animals chose to avoid eating GMOs. Pigs, cows, geese, elk, squirrels, deer, raccoons, mice, and rats. In fact, in, the, in my book, Seeds of Deception, before each chapter, I write a little vignette, The Wisdom of the Animals, with another description. And someone evidently read that about squirrels, where they put corn on the cob out for squirrels, and the squirrels wouldn't eat the BT corn. So he wanted to do this experiment and see if it worked for the squirrels around his house. So he bought a couple of bags of corn, BT corn that produces its own pesticide, and natural corn. And he put it in the garage, waiting for the winter to feed the squirrels. And he forgot. And in the spring, he discovered the bags, and the mice had done the experiment for him. The mice had broken into the non-GM corn and finished every kernel and never touched the BT corn. So it's our job to get humans up to the level of animals. <laughs> Are you up for it? Yeah? Now, they force-fed the rats, and 7 of 20 developed stomach lesions, and 7 of 40 died within two weeks. Now, in the UK, they decided, let's do long-term feeding studies and prove to the skeptical public that GMOs were safe. So they put out a, a request for a proposal to, to create the testing protocol. They got 28 different applications, and they gave the $3 million grant to Dr. Arpad Pustai, the world's leading expert in his field. How many people have heard of Dr. Arpad Pustai? All right. So I write all about him in the first chapter of my book, and by the way, this book is um, Seeds of Deception, is written in story format, and the whole first chapter is Arpad Pustai's story. <clears throat> and it, it's um, hard to put down. That's why I wrote it, because it's, I mean, <clears throat> I might say that's true. But, uh, I know this because someone did a, um, a master's thesis on the impact of my book on the passage of the first state regulation in, on GMOs. It was in Vermont. And he interviewed a bunch of representatives, and they said, normally, books don't influence policymakers because they're too thick, we don't have time. But when I started reading it, I couldn't put it down. And someone said the book spread like wildfire and was the basis for every conversation on GMOs in the State House once it arrived. So here's the first activist tip. If you choose to use this in your lending library, then the, what you say is, just read the first chapter. <laughs> and that's usually all it needs. And that, that first chapter is a kind of a microcosm as we'll see in a minute, of what's going on with GMOs. Because Dr. Pustai, he worked with a team from three different institutes, including his own very prestigious institute, 20 or 30 scientists. And he created a protocol that was going to be used as the EU testing protocol for GMOs. And what he did was <clears throat> he created a potato engineered to produce an insecticide, took a gene from a snowdrop plant, put it into the potato, and as part of the protocol, they fed it to rats along with a complete and balanced diet. 